Good morning, Victory Church. How you doing? I don't know about you, but I don't think there's a better place I would rather be on Sunday morning. Amen? I ran into a friend of mine in the lobby, and he said, Sunday's my favorite day. He said, I can't wait for Sunday. And I just, I agree with that. I feel that same way. Uh, my name is Troy. My wife, Darla, and I get the incredible privilege to pastor this church. And if you are visiting with us this weekend, I want to start off by saying welcome. And then I want you to understand that this is probably the best time of the year for you to visit Victory Church. And there's a couple reasons for that, but one of the, one of the I think one of the most specific is this, that it's during this time of the year, the, the November, the December, the holidays, the end of the year, where, where we get to kind of stop for a moment, and we get to be uh, appreciative of what God has done this year, and then we get to look into next year with anticipation. So we have appreciation, and then we have anticipation. Uh, appreciation is the opportunity for us to come together and say, man, look at all that God has done in 2019 through us and through this church, and next year or next uh, Sunday, we'll put in your hand an annual report that will give you some of those numbers of all that God's done through salvations and baptism and financially and outreach and all kinds of different things, so you'll be able to see all that God has done through you. Uh, along with that, I wanted to take a second. When you came in, you got a little book that looked like this, and you probably got along with that a pen and maybe a sticker, and I, I kind of wanted to explain this to you real quick. This, uh, I gave you the book so you could read into it because I don't want to be able to spend too much time on it, but it talks about giving one day of pay to be able to go to different countries to help bring drinking water and uh, food for them to be able to eat. But I want you to understand, we're not here today to ask you to give to this. You have already given to this. And so we have taken the money that you've already given, and we have given a donation of over $1,000 to Convoy of Hope in your honor. Come on and give God praise for a second. So here's what I love about that is you're not here today to give more money. The reason why I wanted to give this to you is I wanted you to be able to see in depth where your money is going. And so all throughout the year as you're giving and you're tithing and then last year's purpose prevails, we were able to take all of that and through that so into this ministry. And so take that pen and wear it. Take that sticker and wear it. And when somebody says, hey, what is that? Tell them, say, I was able to give through my giving. God did this. And it's one thing I just love so much about this church is I don't. That's one thing as a pastor I'll never do, is I'll never get up here and ask you for money. I'll never get up here and beg you for money. Because of your faithfulness and because we know how to steward what you're giving, we're able to be a part of so many things in so many ways. And so you've already done this. Isn't that cool? Isn't that cool? When's the last time you came into church and found out what you've already done? Like you don't have to get out your wallet. You've already done it. And then next week you'll see on the report all of the things from missionaries to giving. Uh, I was able to deliver the check um, to Nourish Food Bank this past week from you where we paid for 2,000 cans of food for the Smyrna food drive. So come on. Come on. This is what you're doing. You're already doing it. And I just love it. And we just need to be able to look back and appreciate all that God has done. And then in anticipation, be looking into 2020 to what we want God to do. And one of the ways that we do that, as Pastor Brian was just referring to, is through our Purpose Prevails offering. And so on December 8th, we'll gather, and I'll preach for a little bit, and we'll have an incredible time of worship. And then there'll be an opportunity for you to give. Pastor Brian said you can give online. It's 100%. And we're going to give you an opportunity because we want everybody to walk down and have that moment on that Sunday. So we'll give you an envelope where you can just mark what you gave online. And uh, Darla and I will give. We'll be the first ones to give. We always like to lead from the front, not from the back. It's one of our culture statements here. And it'll just be an incredible opportunity for us as a church to come together. And I love what Pastor Brian said, and it's our heart. You pray right now. The Bible says that a man should give what he has planned in his heart. Okay? So we're giving you weeks for you to pray and ask God, what would you have me to give? If God tells you don't give anything, don't give anything. But I'm going to tell you right now, he's not going to tell you that. Because God is all about moving us forward. As your pastor, it's my responsibility to move us forward. Just, just a little step. Move us forward in our, in our spiritual devotion life. Move us in our generosity. Move us in our biblical understanding. We have to take steps forward and grow. Amen? So December 8th, we'll come together and we'll do that. And I believe that we'll be able to take what uh, God does through you and be able to impact the community more and be able to move forward the gospel in 2020. Amen? You ready for the word? Yeah. Do me a favor, you got your Bibles, open up the book of Luke chapter 5. That's where we were. It's pretty much where we'll be um, throughout this entire series, The Wonder of Giving, where we're looking at an interaction between Jesus and Simon Peter. Simon Peter's on a boat, he's fishing, and there's an interaction he has with Jesus. And last week, if you were here, we talked about how uh, Peter goes out to fish, he doesn't catch anything, and he goes to retire his boat, goes, puts his boat up, puts his net up, and Jesus comes up and says, hey, can I get in your boat? 
and they go back out into the water, and Jesus then asks Peter again to cast his net, and we're going to kind of pick up uh, in Luke chapter 5, verse 5, we're going to kind of pick up from that moment, uh, and we're just going to read to verse 9. So Luke 5 starts like this, Simon then answered to Jesus, Simon Peter, Master, we've worked hard all night, and we haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down my nets. We talked about that last week. He needed to catch the woe. He said, when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. That was the woe. And so they signaled to their partners and other boats come to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. And when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and he said, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all of his companions were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. Do me a favor. Look at the person beside you and tell them this. Tell them, there's a catch. Say it again. Say, there's a catch. How many of you remember when you were in uh, probably grade school and you couldn't wait to get older and be in high school? Remember that? Remember how you couldn't wait to be older? And then you got to high school and you couldn't wait to be a college student, right? Y'all remember that? All right. Any, got any high school students in here? Give me, me a little, yeah. All right. College is coming and it's coming quick, okay? Um, and then you get to college and for those of us that are old and near death, you remember that you wanted to get out of college and get into a job, right? Remember when you used to want a job and now that you, thank you, yes, and, uh, and now that you have a job, you're waiting for retirement, right? Um, because we always are anticipating to get older. We always want to be older. We want to be older than we are right now. And I, I guess maybe there is a point where we no longer want to be older. But, but I'm just learning this as I get older. You ready? Uh, the more maturity I have, it means the more management I have to have. It's like the older I get, it's just the more I have to manage. That's all it really means to be older is the older I get, the more I have to manage. For example, now that I'm older, 35 is what I turned this year. Thank you so much for all the applause. Um, I know I look 12, but 35 is doing well for me. Uh, now that I'm 35, I have to manage my sleep, right? D right? Some of y'all aren't doing a good job of managing your own. So, so I have to wake my daughters up. And I have to make sure they go to bed. But there's nobody doing that for me. You know what I mean? There's nobody putting me to bed at night. Darla doesn't sing me lullabies. You know, sleep away, drift away, tiny sleeper. Like, you know, there's, there's no moment. I don't know if that's a real song. But uh, there's a lot of pressure when you're trying to memorize a lot of stuff up here on stage. Thank you for your grace. And so, you know, there's just, there's, there's, I, have to manage, I have to manage my own time, right? Nobody manages your schedule. I have to manage what I eat to manage what I eat. I was back there in Dream Team Care because we provide breakfast for our Dream Teamers, which, by the way, go to Growth Track so you can have breakfast for you on Sunday morning. And I was talking to Jimmy and Everett, and I had a Pop-Tart in my hand. And Jimmy said, you know, there are three servings of fruit in a Pop-Tart. And I was like, really? And so I looked at it, and it's dried pears, dried strawberries, and dried uh, apples. And so now, I'm, now I know how to manage what I eat better. Because when my wife is eating a banana, I'm like, I'm beating you. I got three servings of fruit. You only got one. So, you know, it's just all about management, right? It's just, there's just a management system. The older you get, the more you have to manage. And if I was to be honest with you, I think one of the reasons that Jesus let Peter catch so many fish that his nets were breaking is because I think Jesus wanted to teach Peter about management. And I think it's important for you and I to learn about management. Because if we don't learn how to manage it well, it's possible that we lose it all. And so here's what I want to talk to you just for a moment this morning. I want to talk to you about managing the miracle. Managing the miracle. Last week it was all about catching the miracle. We caught the woe. We've got the miracle. But now we have to learn how to manage it, right? In verse 6, Luke chapter 5, verse 6. Uh, it literally lays it out for us like this. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets actually began to break. And so I brought a net out on stage last week, and you kind of saw the net for catching fish. And that net, it was so heavy with so many fish that the net actually began to kind of tear apart, and it began to break. And I realized this, that Peter wanted so bad to catch fish. He wanted to catch a lot of fish. But he never really processed or thought about what to do once he caught them, right? Like, I think so many of us get so caught up in wanting to get stuff that we don't ever actually process what to do when we get it, right? Like, we want it so bad, 
But how many of us stop and think about, well, what am I going to do when I get it? Because what good is it to get all of this stuff only to lose it because your nets are breaking and your boats are sinking? What's the point? And so I'm beginning to understand this. When it comes to the miracles in my life, they're God's to give, but they're mine to manage. Everything that you're asking and praying for, it's God's responsibility to give it to you, but it's your responsibility to manage it. Every blessing, every miracle, every dollar, every person that comes into your life, it's your responsibility to manage. God blesses it, but it's your responsibility to manage it. Have you ever found yourself complaining about something you were praying for when you got it? Right? You ever been praying for something, and then you get it, and you find yourself complaining about it? Since y'all want to be quiet, I'll give you some examples. Some of y'all were praying for a job, and then you got the job, and you started complaining about the hours, or you started complaining about the pay, or you started complaining about the people who work for you because they don't want to show up on time, and now you're responsible for doing their job for them when they don't show up. And the very thing you were praying for, now you are complaining about. Remember when you were praying for that spouse? Mm-hmm. Y'all can remember right now, oh, Jesus, I want you to send me somebody who loves you and who's dark and handsome. And at least if he doesn't love you, make him dark and handsome. You're praying for this husband, now you're complaining about him. He won't put the toilet seat down. He doesn't know how to load the dishwasher right, right? And what you were praying for, you're now complaining about. Men, don't think you're getting off the hook. You're over there praying for her. Lord, make, make her beautiful. Make her a good cook. Now you weigh 50 pounds extra than you did when y'all met because she's that good of a cook, right? right? Now you're complaining because she doesn't fold laundry right. Now you're complaining about the very thing you were praying for, all right? If I haven't got you yet, here we go. Remember when you were praying for kids? Right? Lord, give us a kid. We'd love to have a kid. Now you're trying to figure out how to legally kill them. Like, how does this work? You're complaining about the very thing you were just praying about. It's all about management. Listen to me. Every answered prayer comes with a guaranteed pressure, and it's management. This was so profound to me. Every answered prayer. God, I, this is what it taught me. Be careful what you pray for. Because when God answers that prayer, it's now my responsibility to manage it. God answered my prayer. I get married. Now I have to manage my marriage. And there's constant conversation and constant issues. We were talking, Darla and I were talking to a friend the other night during setup, and we were talking about marriage counseling. And I was like, we need it daily. Not, not, not weekly, not monthly. I need it daily. Okay? So y'all need to start praying for your pastor now. And the concept is this. You have two individuals who spent majority of their life caring about themselves. And now I'm linked to this individual, and I thank God for the marriage because I prayed for it, but I got to learn how to manage it. God answers my prayer and gives me a job. God answers my prayer and gives me finances, and I have to know how to manage it. Because just because I'm getting it doesn't mean that I can do whatever I want to with it. It's about management. I prayed for you. I prayed for this church for years before any of you even knew me or knew anything about my family or anybody here. I prayed for this church. And in about two months, we'll turn two years old. And I'm telling you right now, more than anything, I'm in the process of management. I'm trying to learn how to manage this church. Because anything you ask and pray for, you then have to learn how to manage. And this is what maturity in Christianity looks like. Because all of us want the answered prayer. Oh, God, I just pray you do this, or I pray you do that, or I pray you do this. And, and that's fine. We should pray that. The Bible says you have not because you ask not. So we should pray for things. But we need to be expecting ourselves to have to manage what we pray for. For example, this microphone. 
you all know that I'm the pastor of this church. Obviously, you've been listening for the past few minutes. And, and, and I, I empower a lot of different people to be able to make decisions. And so not every decision comes past me. But when it came time for this microphone, it, it was a big decision for me because I knew I would be the one speaking every week. And I knew that it would be my voice and my sermon and all these kind of things. And so it was really important for me to have this particular microphone. But I can be in the middle of preaching my sermon, and then all of a sudden, like, one minute you hear me, what's going on? You know, it's you know, just one minute it's there, one minute is what, the reason for this is this, even though it's my microphone, I'm not the one currently managing it, okay? It's my microphone, but Hunter, right back here, is the one who's managing the microphone. So watch this, do it again, Hunter. In the middle of me, I go from yelling to not hear me, and you can't. And everybody on the podcast is like, why? What's happening right now? <laughs> and it's because we're teaching you a lesson. And here's why. Because he knows more about this microphone than I do. The only thing I know about this microphone is it amplifies me when I scream. It's all I know. And that it's flesh color so that maybe you don't see it. That is, that is the extent of my education on this microphone. Hunter could tell you things about this microphone that would make you fall asleep in a conversation. He knows all about it. He knows the name of it. He knows how it works. He knows how the whole system works. So therefore, because he knows more than me, I let him manage it. Walk with me on this. It's my microphone, but he manages it. We have to be able to get to a place where we understand it's my time, but I need someone better than me to manage it. It's my talent, but I need someone smarter than me to manage it. It's my finances, but I need someone who can see bigger than me to manage it. It's our miracle, but we need God to manage it. That has to become our mindset here. Like, I get it. It's yours. I understand it's your net. I understand it's your paycheck. I understand it's your Saturday. I understand it's your gifting. I understand that. But if you're the one that's managing it, you are going to experience a lid that goes with your abilities instead of all the things that God can do when it's under his management. Is there anybody in here who could testify that when you let God manage something, it automatically goes better than when you manage it? Can I hear somebody in here? Three or four of you, okay. Anybody in here, you let God manage your finances and God's done a better job than you. Let me hear you. Let's try this. Anybody in here, you let God manage your time and he's done a better job than you. Anybody in here, you let God manage your talents and he's done a better job than you. He's a better manager than me. And that's the whole concept of, of, people often will ask, why do you serve? Or why do you tithe? And they're asking these questions because they really want an answer. And here's the best answer I can give them. Because when I give God my time, and I give God my talent, and I give God my tithe, I'm asking God to manage things for me when I know I'm not the best manager. So I have to be careful that I'm not trying to manage my own miracle, but allowing God to do it. About 11 chapters later, after this whole situation with Peter on the boat, you actually find Jesus in the book of Luke teaching on management again. So he's already shown, he's illustrated Peter management, now he's teaching on it. And it says in Luke chapter 16, verse 10, watch this, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. We've heard this principle before. If you are a good steward of little, then more comes. If you are a bad steward of little, then you won't get more. Look at me. It's a scripture about management. Jesus is literally saying those who can manage a little well get more. But those who cannot manage a little well, they don't end up in hell. They don't end up on this. They just don't get more. Because God is watching our ability to manage what he's given us. And let me ask you a question. If I got up here today and, and, and y'all were like, hey, um, there's a lot of, if, if you went to V-Kids and nobody was there, you couldn't drop your kids off, right? And Jenny's back there playing bubble breaker on her phone, and she's looking at you like, what do you want? And you're like, can you watch my kid? And she's like, yeah, put him in the room, make sure you close the door behind you. Is it, you know, so that was kids. And then you come down, and like you go over to the coffee, and it's like, they got, you know, there's, you, you go to get coffee, and there's no coffee. And then you come in here, and there's no music, no instruments up here, and I got a stereo, and I hit play, and it's like, you know, never lost a battle, 
and the CD starts skipping because we do CDs here, and, and it's like, never lost a battle. And then I got up here and I started asking for money. You'd be like, where's the money that we've already given? You would go, you're a poor manager, and so we don't trust you to manage. It's a very easy concept in our lives. I'll break it down even easier. There's things I can trust my nine-year-old to do that I don't trust my five-year-old to do. Because currently, my nine-year-old is a better manager than my five-year-old. Let me give you an example. I let my nine-year-old eat in the living room. She can take her food if she wants to, and she can go to the living room and grab the little side table and set up, and she can watch TV while she eats, depending on the situation. But I will not allow my five-year-old to do that. And here's why. Because my nine-year-old can sit there and eat a bowl of mac and cheese and not get any mac and cheese on the floor. It won't be on the couch. It'll all be on her plate or in her mouth. But if I let Casey Ray have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and I say, go eat it in the living room, there will be jelly on the walls. (laughs) There will be jelly on the floor. There will be jelly on the TV. There will be jelly in places that I'm 100% sure she can't reach. But she'll just go through in the name of the Holy Spirit, just anointing the house, christening the house with peanut butter and jelly. Because I can't manage her, right? She's not managing well. So I'm not going to give her more opportunity if she doesn't manage well what she's already got. And this is the kind of message that we may not like to hear, but we have to hear. God is a good, good father. And he watches our ability to manage. And if we manage well, we get more. But if we can't manage well, he won't give us more because he knows that if we're poor managers and he gives us more, the more will kill us. We will mess around and lose it all to begin with because we'll have breaking nets and sinking boats. It's all about management. And I want us to understand the importance of not just getting the miracle, but being able to manage the miracle. Because if you can't manage the miracle, you're going to lose it in the end. And what was the point of ever having it to begin with? You say, Troy, what is, what's the big deal with management, man? You're really excited about management. And, and, you know, I go to the restaurant, and managers don't really seem like they have much going for them. What's, what's the big deal about management? Why is Jesus talking about management? And here's why. And I spent all week on this statement. So if you don't like it, then you need to like it. <laughs> because I feel like if you catch this, you'll start to understand the importance of management at a level that maybe you haven't understood it yet. Here's what it says. The enemy can't stop God from blessing you with more, so he tries to get us to mismanage what we have. The devil can never stop God from blessing you with more unless he can get you to mismanage what you have. Because scripture just clearly said it. He who mismanages a little is going to mismanage more. So I just won't give it to him. He who manages well a little gets more because I know he can manage it. And so the devil says, child of God, daughter of God, man of God, here's the deal. I can't stop your father from blessing you, but if I can get you to mismanage what you have, then the flowing will automatically stop. I believe God wants us to have more. And I don't just mean finances. I don't want you to leave out of here and think this is a prosperity message. When I say more, I mean more in every aspect. More influence, more authority, certainly more blessings, more more time, more treasure, more talent. I I think God wants us to have it more, but he wants us to manage what we already have. So then what does good management look like, right? Troy, if you're telling us that we need to be able to manage well, what does it look like to be a good manager? And I had this statement in my mind. And I thought that I could give you this statement and then I can break it down a little bit. And here's what I think a good manager looks like, what a good manager's thought process process is, and it's this. Get it to me so that it can get through me. A good manager says, get it to me, God, so that it can get through me. Not get it to me so that I can have it, but get it to me so that it can get through me. Try this. Say, get it to me so it can get through me. Let's try it again. Get it to me so it can get through me. It's fun, right? Y'all aren't very excited this morning. That's kind of disappointing. Um, I was way more excited about that than you were. And so let's try it one more time. Get it to me so it can get through me. 
There we go. Y'all sound better. That's Victory Church. So I'm reading Luke 5 again this week, and I saw something this week that I had actually never really seen before. And it kind of jumped out in, to me, and I really wanted to dive into it with you because I think it really supports the idea of if you get it to me so it can get through me. So we got to go back to Luke chapter 5, verses 5 and 6, and we're going to do a little Bible study together. You ready? Ready to do a little Bible study together? Okay, here we go. But because you say so, we talked about that last week, right? Because you say so, I will let down the nets. Everybody say I. I. I will let down the nets. Y'all see that? That's what it says in the Bible. I will let down the nets. Now watch this. When they had done so, wait a minute, keep reading, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets begin to break. Help me out here. I, I know I went to Craigmont High School. I know y'all don't know what that means, but walk with me on this. I let down my net when they did so. When did the I become they? I let down the net. They caught so much that their nets were breaking. So obviously there's more people in this boat, right? But it was Peter who let down the net. And yet they are being blessed. If I could call Peter right now, if I could just get him on the phone, get him to answer, if I could talk to him for just a few seconds, here would be my question for him. Hey, Peter, quick question. What did it feel like when your sacrifice became their supper? What did that feel like? When you let down your net, but they got to eat. Right? Here's what I think it means to be a good manager. Knowing that you're sowing so they can eat. That's different. It's not so much I'm sowing so that I can get something. It's I'm sowing that someone else can eat. That's interesting to me. That's a different maturity for me. That's a different management system. Because now I'm moving from a mindset of God give me so I can have into a mindset of God give me so I can provide. It's management. It's maturity. It's the growing of your Christianity. It's understanding that God will use your sacrifice to give them supper. Right? So, so I'll break it down for you. One of it would be the example of what we did today with one day. That you gave your net and they're going to eat. It's what you did with the canned food drive. You gave your net, and they're going to eat. But it's, there's even more to it than that. Because listen to me, when we launched the church, there was about 40 people who used their nets to launch this church. They used their finances, they used their time, and they used their talent. And for a certain period of time, some of you came, and you were able to feed off the word. You were able to feed off of worship. You were able to feed off a of kids' ministry because they were using their nets. So it was their nets, and it was your supper. See what I'm saying? Now we've moved a little bit, and you went to grow track, and you joined the dream team, and now God is no longer using their net to feed you, but God's now using your net to feed other people. And it continues a process where God says that if you'll give me your net, I'll use it so that they have supper. I'll use it to nourish them. I'll use it to provide for them. And watch this. And then they will grow, and I will use their net for other people. And it's the continual process of salvation and sanctification and what God's doing through us. Use my soul so for their supper. But here's where it gets even better and even deeper. Because there's always a time where we struggle. And watch this. God will use your net in a good season to help somebody in their bad season. And then when you find yourself in a bad season, they're now in a good season. And God will now use their net in a good season to feed you in your bad season. And it's a cycle that God produces that he says, hey, guess what? I can use you if you will be all about get it to me so that it will get through me. But if your passion is for it to stop with you, then God can't use your sacrifice to provide other people supper. And at some point, it stops with you. And no longer does your sacrifice go to bless other people. Make sense? I think one of God's common characteristics is to respond to our need with the opportunity to sow a seed. Isn't that weird? Because here's the deal. When we're growing up, 
and we have a need, our parents don't go tell us to do something. They meet the need, right? Mom, I'm hungry. Make you a sandwich. Dad, I need to go to the game. I'll drive you. We're meeting needs. And that's fair when we are young in our Christianity. It's the same thing as us young in our actual life. But as we grow in Christ, the concept is now that God is responding not just to meet our need, but he's responding to our need with the opportunity of sowing a seed. Okay? You ever heard the Bible, the Bible verse, give and it will be given to you? Ever heard that? Luke 6, 38? Hey, people like to misuse that because people will put it completely on a financial aspect. It's not a financial scripture. Hear me. It's an everything scripture. It's referring to everything. Actually, when you read it, he talks about three things. He talks about condemning, he talks about judging, and he talks about forgiving. And he's saying if you don't condemn, if you, if you give condemnation, then you're going to get condemnation. If you give forgiveness, then you're going to get forgiveness. And here's the principle that Jesus is teaching, is that when it comes to good management, whatever you give is what you get, right? It doesn't matter. Whatever you give is what you get. If you give it, you get it. And God's teaching us the principle of us being able to sow our net and allow someone else to eat that dinner. It's a concept of whatever I give, I get. Maybe you still don't get it. Let me walk you through this a little bit. There's a story in the Old Testament, a prophet by the name of Elijah, and he needs to eat. And he's praying because he's about to, not, about to die, basically, because he doesn't have any food. And God sends him to meet this widow and says, the widow will feed you. Okay? So he shows up to this widow's house, and she's out in the yard collecting sticks. And he walks up to her and says, hey, what you doing? And she says, I'm collecting sticks to go make one last meal for me and my child, and then we're going to eat and die because we don't have anything to be able to provide for us to eat. So we're going to eat, and then we're going to die. And Elijah says to her, now listen, she just gave him a what? A need. I have a need. Elijah then says to her, make me some bread. How does that help me? Right? I need food, and you want me to make you a sandwich? Like, there was no HelloFresh back then, right? She couldn't just hit it, and it show up on her doorstep. So, like, she's like, what do you want me to do? So, in other, other words, I don't have enough food, and Elijah's telling her to go make him some food. And if you read the story, she goes and makes him some food, and the Bible says that, therefore, from that point on, she does not go without. All right? Let me give it to you another way. There's one time where all of these people were gathering to hear Jesus talk. The Bible says about 5,000 men and then their women, their, their wives and their kids. So there's probably about 15,000 people, theologians say. And the disciples are there and Jesus is teaching them. And the Bible doesn't quite say this, but here's what I think happened. The disciples got hungry. And so Jesus is teaching and the disciples' stomachs start growling. You know, And all of a sudden the disciples are like, man, I want to eat. And one of the disciples is like, hold on, I got this. And so he goes over to Jesus, and he's like, hey, Jesus, these people really need to eat. Like, look at them, they should eat. So why don't you send them on somewhere so they can get some food? There was a need. Jesus looks at them and says, you feed them. Doesn't make any sense to me. I'm telling you I have a need for food, and you're telling me to feed them, right? Once again, Peter's in the boat. I need some fish. Jesus gives him so many that his nets are breaking. It's the understanding, right, that if you will give, then you will get. It's that principle. So here's the ultimate question for us as a church. You ready? Are you a sower or an eater? Are you a sower or an eater? 2 Corinthians 9.10 puts it like this. Now he who supplies seed to the sower, seed to the sower, and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. There's a verse in Isaiah that's referring to this as well that says that he will supply seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So which one are we? Am I a sower or am I an eater? Well, Troy, you're going to have to break that down a little bit more because I'm not sure I understand the negatives or the positives of either. I'm so glad you asked because I've been wanting to eat a Pop-Tart since I started preaching. And so throw me that Pop-Tart real quick. I'm going to show you what it's like to be an eater, okay? And so because of the fact that I have to preach, I'm only going to take a little bit of this, Tim. I'm going to give this back to you. Don't you eat it, okay? Be a sower, not an eater. Quit playing. So, if I'm an eater, then I find what I need, 
This is a really bad idea, by the way. Probably shouldn't preach and eat a Pop-Tart. But I eat it. Y'all just chill there for a minute. Read your Bibles. I can taste the dried pear, the dried strawberries, and the dried apple. So I eat. Bear with me. Let me give you this too. I'm sorry. I can't eat all this. It's so dry. If only I had some butter. Oh, man. Anybody in here put your Pop-Tart in a toaster and put butter on it? Y'all are going to heaven. Everybody else, you better get saved. Oh, so good. So good. It's not that good, but it's good. Food's dry. Thank you. No love at my own church. Now watch this. I've eaten it, and now it's what? It's gone. So it it, it did what I needed, but now it's gone. So if I'm an eater, I have what I need, but at some point it stops, right? And not only does it stop, but it definitely doesn't impact anybody else. But if you were to give me a seed, let me see that real quick. See if you can pick that up. Yep, you're much stronger than me. If you give me a seed, then I can plant the seed, and I can not only have something to eat right now, but I can have something to eat later, right? And then if I needed to, anybody want an apple? All right, let's see if we can throw an apple in here without hurting people. There we go. So if I need to, by the way, these, I ain't throwing it back there. What's wrong with you? You're going to injure somebody. So, so here's what's cool. Y'all don't even, you know, you know how much y'all love and trust me? Y'all don't know where these apples have been. Y'all don't know what happened to them. The, the insecticides that have been on them. All right, it's the last two I'm throwing. Good catch. All right, so here's the deal. You're going to miss the last one. Got to catch the, there we go, okay. So here's what's so important about that is now not only do I get to eat, and not only do I get to continue to eat, but I get to help what? You eat. So there's a difference in me being a sower and an eater. If I'm an eater, once I have it, it's gone. If I'm a sower, I continue to have. And guess what? If you need something, I have enough for you too. It's important for us to understand the difference between a sower and an eater. And here's what I'm learning about that. If I could sum it up into a sentence, it would look like this. What I keep for myself is just what I have. But what I give is multiplied. What I keep for myself is just what I have. I had the Pop-Tart. It's over. Honestly, it wasn't that good. It's gone. But if you give me a seed, I can sow the seed, and I can have something now, and I can have something later, and I can have something for anybody else who needs as well. If I keep it, it's just what I have. If I give it, it becomes multiplied. Can I show you, can I show you this principle in Luke 5? Can I show you how God did it? This is so cool. Watch this out. All right, Luke chapter 5, verse 7. So they signaled their partners. Now remember, Peter's in the boat, nets breaking, fish are about to come out. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and they filled what? Both boats. So imagine, he's got this net full of fish. It's breaking. Naturally, we would say, I'm going to give you half, and I'm going to keep half right? That's what we would naturally do. My boat is sinking. If I give you half of the fish, my boat will no longer sink, nor will your boat sink. But it came and filled both boats, and then here's my favorite part, so full that they both began to sink. What happened? If he would have kept it, that's just what he would have had. He had a sinking boat, right? Yet somehow he gave some, and they both had sinking boats, because this is the principle of God, is that if, I, if you'll let me get it to you so that it'll go through you, I'll be able to not only impact them, but I'll also be able to impact you. Elijah ate and the woman ate. The 15,000 people ate and it says the disciples took home leftovers. Because God says if you'll be a sower, not just an eater, I'll feed them and I'll feed you. Do you understand it? It's a principle. It's management. God says if you manage this well, not only can you be blessed, but everybody can be blessed in the process. And so we started off with 
The attitude of a good manager would be get it to me so that it can get through me. And now look at it like this. When I let the seed go through me, God will make sure what I need gets to me. If I will let that seed go through me, God will make sure that what I need gets to me. Paul and Crystal are a couple, precious couple. They're on the dream team. Crystal serves in worship. Paul serves in production. Have three of the most precious kids you will ever see in the world. Love the Lord. Just an incredible couple. And when Paul moved here, Paul was taking a similar job, same concept, but in the schooling system. But they were moving here. And not a couple of things happened. First of all, Paul found out that the, the new job he was taking was significantly less in amount of money than the job he was leaving. And then when he gets here, uh, and I had never actually heard about this before, in the school system, you have to go a while before you get your first paycheck. Like it might be a month or two, I don't know the exact uh, system. And so he gets here, he moves here with his family, his three precious kids. Uh, he's already realizing that he's getting paid less than what he was getting paid at his old job. And now he finds out that he won't get another, won't get his first paycheck till a certain amount of time later. Watch this. During this time, his wife loses her job. Could you imagine that? And so they're at a place of need, right? They need food. They need to be able to do things with their kids. Their kids don't understand the process. So they're asking questions like, can we get ice cream? Can we go here? Can we do that? Because our kids don't often understand what it means like to, or what it means to be struggling financially. And so they're in a place of need. And one of the things that I thought was very interesting that Paul told me is he said, throughout the whole time, we never stopped giving to God. That was wild for me. Because I don't know about you, but I have the hardest time giving to God when I think I'm going to be in need. Right? It's like, God, I really want to give to that. But then am I going to have enough? Right? Isn't that kind of how we think? And so when you meet somebody who's just found themselves in an interesting place where they have a big need, it's naturally a human instinct to go, well, I will quit giving until I get to a place where I can give back to God. And God, of course, is trying so bad to destroy that concept in our mind because in our biggest time of need, we're abandoning the only one who can really help us. And so Paul said, I never, he said, I never quit. We said, we never quit giving. As a family, we never quit giving to the church. They never quit serving. Never once did she get off the stage. Never once did he quit serving in production. They just kept on serving, kept on loving God, kept on bringing their kids to church, kept teaching them about God. Huge. Bible studies. It was incredible. And I was talking to him. He had sent me an email about some of this, and he had finally gotten a particular check. He said it was the biggest check he had ever gotten. Uh, his wife, Crystal, applied for a job. They loved her so much, they invented a position for her, getting paid more than she was getting paid at her old job, right? So you watch God start restoring all of this stuff because they were faithful through it. They were faithful through it because what they would have kept is just what they would have had. But because they continued to give to God in every asphalt, uh, 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 area, time, talent, treasure, because they kept giving to God, God continued to pour back. And so now they're here overwhelming, getting all this stuff. And in the email that Paul sent me was so cool. The whole ending of it was just different ways of praising God. It was just, God is so good. He's my provider. He's just saying all these great things. He's in complete amazement of God. God's amazing. God's amazing. Why? Because if you will allow that seed to go through you, God will make sure that whatever you need gets to you. And I think that's a moment, not so much as a church, but as an individual that we need to learn. That God, you know my need more than I know my need. And you care more about my needs being met than I care about my needs being met. And so if I trust you and I allow that seed that you give to go through me, then I have the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings and the creator of all things responsible for making sure that what I need gets to me. And this is what I think Jesus was teaching Peter. If it's just about you getting something to have it, then at some point that supply runs out. But if it's about getting so that you can give, so that it can go through you, that supply never ends. And now that God can trust you with a little, now he trusts you with more. And on and on and on. And those hands are open and it's just flowing straight through. 
some of the most incredible moments straight through to be able to bless other people. And at some point, you step back and see that all God has done through you. And mark my words, you get to a place where you don't even care about whether or not it gets to you. Because you can't, because you are in love with the aspect of it getting through you. And once you do this, then you can become available for amazement. So let me explain. This is, this is a really big deal to me. I often wonder if people struggle, and I'm going to talk about me for a second. If people struggle seeing me act as an ordinary person when I claim to live for an extraordinary God, right? Like maybe I should be on this extraordinary high because of the God that I serve. Maybe I should be astonished by God more. And so I'm finishing up Luke chapter 5, and I get towards the end, and and put verses 8 and 9 up there for him real quick. And this was so crazy. It says, when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and he said, go away from me, Lord, for I'm a sinful man. Now watch this. For he and all of his companions were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. They were astonished by God. They were astonished by the catch. They were astonished by the miracle. They were astonished. That's great, Troy, but what does astonished mean? Here's the definition for astonished. The word astonished means to be filled with sudden and overpowering wonder. Here is the wonder of giving. The wonder of giving is when you're giving something and you find the amazement of God in the process. It's when you make yourself available and God does something bigger than you could ever imagine. It's being able to see the amazement of God, the amazingness of God. God's so amazing. Him doing something amazing through the process that you gave. So a couple weeks ago, uh, I was teaching the students at our youth group, small group meeting, and I felt the urge to teach them about giving because I think it's something that has somehow gotten a, a dirty reputation, especially amongst Christians. And I thought it was important at that age to teach them about giving, and we had an incredible time. They leaned in, they took it in. But we got to talking at this one moment, and we were talking about all the miracles that God did. And through our conversation, we found out something. We found out that every miracle of God that we could talk about or we could bring up or think of, it began with somebody gave. So they were just throwing miracles out. They were like, you know, what about the feeding of the 5,000? We were like, well, the little boy gave his lunch. They were like, well, what about when Moses split the Red Sea? And I was like, well, if you look into it, Moses didn't want to go. He was telling Jesus, I got a stuttering problem, or telling the Lord he had a stuttering problem. And so he gave his time and he gave his talent. And because he gave of himself, you had the splitting of the Red Sea. They were calling out miracles. Uh, they were like, what about the woman who the jar of oil never stopped? Was like, she gave her oil. What about the, the, the turning water into wine? Well, they gave the basins. What about the immaculate conception of Jesus? She gave her womb. Every miracle in the Bible started when somebody gave. Every miracle of God begins when somebody is willing to give what they have. And when you give something, you unlock the opportunity for God to do a miracle. But here's the best part. You unlock an opportunity for you to be amazed by God. So here's my question. When's the last time you were astonished by God? When was the last time you were amazed by God? Second question. When was the last time you made yourself available so that you could be amazed by God? I'm just learning that every great thing God does, it begins when somebody gave. Our salvation Our salvation is built because of John 3, 16, and it says what? For God so loved the world that he gave. God has been modeling the wonder of giving from the beginning of time. Trying to let us see that if we'll give what we have, God will turn around and use it to do miracles. And then we will be astonished by God. 
and amazed by God. And then watch this. I believe we become addicted to it. And then we want to keep giving because we will keep wanting to see God do miracle amongst us and through us. Amen? So it's how we manage the miracle. Everybody who's sitting in here this morning, God has done something amazing in your life. Whether you see it yet or not, he has. And here's something we believe at Victory, that now God wants to do something amazing through you to impact other people's lives. He wants to use your net. He wants to use your boat. He wants to use whatever you have to give so that he can do a miracle and leave you astonished. And in this time of the year, in this season, our prayer has to become, God, what do you want to use me to do? What do I have that I can give? And if that becomes our prayer, God answers that prayer. Amen? So do me a favor, would you stand just for a moment? Here, here's how I'd like to close out my time with you. I'd, I'd like us to pray that kind of prayer. God, what do I have to give? What do I have to give? What are you asking me to give? And I'm talking in every aspect, church. In every aspect. God might be talking about your time. He might be talking about your treasure. He might be talking about your talent. I don't know what God's wanting you to give today. But I think there's a maturity process where God's wanting to grow us. And he's wanting to do more miracles in our life, but we have to learn how to manage it first. So just close your eyes. However you would do it. You might put your hands up. You might not. But Father, we just come to you right now and we ask you in the most humble of ways. What are you asking us to give, God? You went up to Peter and you asked him for his boat. You asked him to put his net in the water. And because of that, not only did he experience a miracle through him, but he watched other people be blessed by it. And Father, I believe you still want to do that in our lives. You want to not only bless us, but you want to use us to bless others. So every individual that's in here who loves you, they serve you, they're coming to church because they worship you and they want to know more about you. God, you're calling them to a new level of maturity. You're calling them to move forward. You're calling them to be better managers of what you've given them. And God, would you speak to us this morning and make real to us this morning how you want to use us and what you want to do through us. And God, would you give us the opportunity to understand that if we will trust you in managing what we have, there will be a moment where we become astonished by you. Come on, in your, in your own words, just pray that. God, give me an opportunity to be astonished by you. Give me an opportunity to be amazed by you. Put me in a situation, put me in a moment where I can experience you at a new level. Where I can experience the wonder of giving and the wonder of following you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray and everybody said.